All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session on equitable grading practices, gaining focus and insight. Um, my name is Tara Sikorsky, and I am here with my colleagues, Kristen Sarginger, and um, we have um, members of our educational community, Liam trans Gleason from uh, Bullis Charter School and Uchenna Lewis from Partners in School Innovations. And we're here today to share with you some of our work around our equitable grading practices, community of practice, and um, some of the results of those efforts um, and the impact that our community of practice has had on our educational community. All right, so as we engage today, we have some community agreements. Um, the first is to keep students at the center of our work. We are passionate educators who are here to support our students and to give our students the best education possible. Um, so as we engage today, please keep students at the center of our work. Be present, be curious, and be open to new possibilities and new ideas. As we engage in dialogue together, make space and take space. So be conscientious of um, your, your offerings and um, your, the, the amount of mic um, you take up. Um, be conscientious of intent and impact. Sometimes our intentions and our impacts align and sometimes there's a disconnect. Um, if you feel like there is a disconnect between somebody's intent and impact, I invite you back to that, that norm of um, unpacking it with curiosity. Um, grading is sometimes a very personal and a very passionate area in education. And so as we engage in our conversations today, um, we ask that you honor and uphold confidentiality. So what is said here stays here. However, the ideas and the, the thoughts that you take away um, are things that you are welcome to share. And then as always together, we know a lot. Um, grading for equity is an area that is, um, for me, I'm constantly growing and deepening in my work around this topic. And I've learned so much from engaging in conversations with other educators and um, my colleagues and pushing each other's thinking. So we invite you to do the same. All right, so for our outcomes today, the first is we're gonna um, give you a little bit of background about our Santa Clara County Office of Education, Grading for Equity Community of Practice, and a little bit about future, the future of the project. Um, we'll introduce the three pillars of the grading for equity and systems that are in place to perpetuate grading perpetuate inequities. Um, we'll explore the grading for equity community practices impact on equity-based practices at both the classroom and system level. And we'll reflect on potential barriers and potential solutions to bringing about equity and grading. So on our agenda, um, I'll be introducing our, our, our community practice and what we've been doing there. Um, Kirsten will, um, explore the grading inequity and introduce those three pillars. Liam will share her journey and her class experience with um, grading for equity and um, some of the changes that she's made over the years to support more equitable grades for students. And Uchenna will um, explain her systems approach and um, how, and both, both, our guests, both of our guests Liam and Uchana will share how the community of practice has in influenced their approach. There will be time at the end for a question and answer, and then we'll um, end with reflections and some closure for today's session. All right, so about our community of practice, um, back in October, or maybe it was even before then, in August, um, there was an idea to create a book study and community of practice around Joe Feldman's Grading for Equity um, text which I, I do have right here. Good old Zoom background, well, maybe, there we go. Um, and so we started this community of practice, which is a combination of book study and um, exploration and discussion and community um, to help people unpack and explore some of these ideas. So our goals of our community of practice was to reflect upon current grading practices and how they um, supported or hindered a growth mindset of our students, because we know that grades can influence how students feel about themselves within the classroom and can either promote status or 
take away student status within the classroom. Um, we also um, use our community of practice to explore those practices and how those practices impact students. So tying back to the, that mindset um, and to ex learn strategies to make grading more equitable. So a lot of our educators talk about standards-based grading and some are even exploring ungrading, which is a completely new take on grading, which I am still exploring that, that whole idea of ungrading. And then um, we're continuing to build on an understanding about the standards-based grading. Um, and most importantly, we've taken a lot of time to analyze the role that homework plays in grading and how um, we can unpack some of those biases in our grading systems. So our COP journey is based on the various chapters, as I said, of Joe Feldman's Grading for Equity work. This outlines our, our journey so far. Um, so we've looked at the why, we've looked at the pillars of accuracy, we've looked at the pillars of bias resistance. At our next meeting, we'll be actually looking at that third pillar of motivation. And then um, there's time to look at building those soft skills without a grade. So how do you get students to be accountable in the classroom? And then also we have some time for planning with the future. Our community of practice this year is going to um, end with the capstone event of um, Joe Feldman coming and engaging in a question and answer with, with our community of practice. Each community of practice follows a similar format. We have some sort of launch activity where we give either a quote or maybe some data to look at, um, something to bring everyone together and set the tone for the meeting and to launch us into this exploration of ideas. Um, the exploration ideas comes with um, focused discussions around the specific chapters of um, focus for that session. And then um, from there, after the discussion of those chapters in the book, there's times for um, Java-like um, cohorts to summarize and apply their learnings to their own context and to share their thinking, so share some of the things that they're trying and to generate uh, a variety of new ideas. So that is a little bit about our COP. In addition to our COP, of course, we've been doing work with um, individual districts in supporting their implementation of equitable grading practices. Um, I would like to turn this over to my colleague, Kristen Sargenger, who is going to lead you through our part about exploring equity in our grading system and those three pillars. Thank you. As we did. Thanks, Tara. Um, so now what I'd like to do is really look about exploring equity and grading in more depth and have you take a like a reflective stance on your um, your work. Can you go to the next slide, please? So I want us to think for a minute about why we grade. So a lot of us here are teachers and you know we're asked to put grades in the grade book. We're asked, you know, but why are we doing that? What's the purpose of doing that? Who is it for? And what does it communicate? So what we want to do now is actually um, have you think about that um, for a little bit and then going into a breakout room and have a discussion for three minutes with those in your breakout room about why you grade. Um, so I'm going to give you about one minute right now to kind of personally think about that question. And then we'll put you into breakout rooms um, after that. So it takes um, a minute for personal reflection time. All right, Uchenna, I'm going to ask if you could put everyone into breakout rooms for three minutes for your breakout rooms, and then we'll come back.
welcome your beautiful faces. It's so great. I actually took myself off of that pinpoint so I can, or spotlight so I can actually see you. Super, super great. Okay. So what we want to do now is really think about, uh, as we reflect on this question, why do we grade? I'd love to hear some folks either in the chat or, um, you know, unmuting, um, if you feel comfortable, like about this reason about grading and why we grade. I'm going to give us about like one minute for you to either unmute or write in the chat, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Kirsten, we, in my group, we were like, well, one thing is, is that we have to, because we have to turn in grades and we have to have a way to communicate with parents about progress. So it's a compliance piece, right? It's part of my job. And what is it? It's communicating to parents. Thanks, Amanda, for sharing what your group talked about. Um, anyone else? One thing that we talked about in our group is um, the fact that we want to uh, measure is how is the student is working towards mastery. So, 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 so it's a measuring tool and how close they are to close to being a master of the content. Thanks, Eddie. Um, anyone else? Um, one thing I would note is that there are times when grades become like a gatekeeper, you know, like when you're determining if students are going to be allowed to go into gate or AP classes or things of that nature. Right. Sometimes it is that gatekeeper. We think about that sometimes. I know I'm a math coordinator and sometimes getting those higher level math courses in middle school, who gets the opportunity to go into that advanced grade eight, advanced grade seven class. And that can make a difference in the courses you're able to take in high school because of that track that you get in. So thank you so much for sharing. So you know, a lot of different ideas about the purpose and the um, who is it for and, and why, what does it communicate? So again, as we reflect upon that, um, I want us to really kind of thinking, be thinking about what do we mean by equity in education? Um, next slide, please. So um, there's three different definitions of equity education that we want to kind of focus on right now. And I'm going to ask some of my wonderful folks here to read um, some of these for us. Um, so can I have, let's see, Allie, is it Allie? Can you read the first one from the National Equity Project? Sure. Uh, each child receives what they need to develop to their full academic and social potential. Great. And we'll see the term, the word need um, in um, capitalized. And it's, we all students don't need the same thing, right? And so it's so important to know our kids, their strengths, and kind of how they best learn so we can give them what they need. Um, can I have Stacy? Can you read the C A C D E one? If I unmute, yes. Equity is fair outcomes, treatment, and opportunities with the aim of ensuring that all students are able to thrive or learn and thrive. Thanks a lot, Stacey. And again, that key all is in that italics, but it's not just some. We're not sorting students by some get this and some get this. We want all students to be able to master um, grade level content. We want them all to thrive and be the best person they can be. And the last one, can I have Amanda read that one from Elena Aguilar? Educational equity means there is no predictability of success or failure that correlates with any social or cultural factor. Right. And that's that bias piece, right? Like sometimes when students walk in the room and we have this preconceived notion because of their gender, the color of their skin, um, you know, we have these ideas about what they can do and what they can't do. And we want to take that away, that predictability away, and really take everyone at this belief that everyone can do and master and be successful. Next slide, please. So in, um, in the Grading for Equity book, Joe Feldman talks about three pillars of grading for equity. Next slide, please. The for, um, and the three pillars are accurate grading, bias-resistant grading, and motivational. Next slide, please. So when we think about the ac um, grading being accurate, the thing they stress in the book is the importance of and really focusing just on students' academic level of performance not putting in any of the other factors that kind of go into grades, but how are they doing in mathematics? How are they doing in biology? Really like being specific and use mentally sound mathematical calculations. And so we really want to get away from like adding a point here, adding a point here, taking away points for homework, whatever those things are, but it's mathematically sound and using reliable scales. And a lot of us use programs that help us kind of figure that out. We want to make sure that it's mathematically correct. Um, next slide, please. We also want to take away that bias. Um, students aren't, aren't punished for the lack of resources, not, not bringing their materials into class, not um, sitting quietly and um, you know, 
studiously at their desks, like just really looking at their academics and not those other factors that can, can kind of sometimes we bring into our grades. And we all have blind spots. Every one of us do. I mean, we're, you know, in our 20s, 30s, 40s, some of us even in our 50s, right? And so we, we've we lived a long life. And so we have these blind spots and what's important to us. But we have to really be careful of those blind spots that they don't get in their way and um, bring affect students' grades by what we think is important. Next slide, please. And motivation. We need to really think about what motivates our kids. And one of the things they talk about in the book is that this idea about punishment and punitive doesn't always motivate our kids. Oh, I'm gonna give you a zero. Oh, I'm gonna take away this. It doesn't motivate them. There's no research about that. So how, what can we do to help motivate our kids? Some of the th things they talk about are like doing retakes, like really showing students that I believe in you, you can do this, try again, right? So helping students move towards mastery, like you said earlier. Um, next slide, please. So as we, I review these three pillars of grading for equity, again, by, in Joe Feldman's book, this idea about accurate grading, bias-resistant grading, or motivational grading, what resonates most with you as you think about those pillars? And you can just jot those down in the chat right now for me. Jot, jot down your ideas in the chat. That's over you. Yeah, motivation. What motivates them? How do we motivate students to continue to learn? Okay, motivational. Um, okay, next slide, please. So um, one of the things we really wanted to um, do with our community of practice is gather one community of, of educators together. And again, with this common um, focus around grading for equity and really wanting to do what's best and really look at our grading practices and how can we make them even more equitable. So again, that's kind of the impetus for our grading for equity. It was one community and there's not one way to get equitable grading. Like we all kind of think about what that looks like and sounds like for us. But at the end of the day, it has to be what's best for kids and make take away that bias and make sure making sure that it's accurate. Next slide, please. I now like to introduce one of our amazing, amazing um, teachers that's part of our grading for equity community of practice that agreed to present her journey with us today. Her name is Leem Tran Swison. And so she's a, a teacher at Bullis Charter School. And I'm going to turn it over to her and let her tell you more about her and her journey. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Lynn Trent Sison, and I teach math at the middle school at Bulls Charter School. Um, and this school year, I'm glad to have been part of this um, community of practice on grading for equity because um, a lot of what we have been doing has reaffirmed what I have been working on um, over a course of years, making small changes. And um, it has really supported uh, what I'm doing and make me feel like I, I'm doing the right thing for our learners. Um, as I share with you what I have done in my classroom, I'm gonna highlight how Joe Feldman's book um, has reaffirmed um, the changes um that i've made in my classes um over the last six nine ish years um and how it's having me rethink um and think about how i need to adjust as i continue to grow as an educator um so on the next slide when i first began teaching at local high schools i gave grades in the same way that i was accustomed to in my own schooling and in my teaching preparation programs i had categories for everything that I was doing in the classroom because I believe that they were important. So they should be included in the grade. That was my thought. Um, uh, I did this for my first few years at Bullis um, because again, that was what I was accustomed to. Um, so over on the left side, we see these were the categories that I had um, over the course of the years. Um, there became more emphasis on like this, the, my grading was more on what can they do in the classroom um, and not so much what came from outside the classroom. And that was where I wanted to shift my focus um, because 
I, I don't have control and reading creating for equity I I was so glad that someone else um like published thought the same thing and thought that this was like what, how we should move forward um and so so my grading has moved towards being completely um a hundred percent based on the standards for the courses that I teach um and like this is all just something that I was able to do because I'm lucky and fortunate enough to be at a school where my team that I teach with and the administration um, really supports what we're doing so that we are supporting our learners the best that we can. Um, so I, uh, in implementing standards based grading, we assess our learners every week so that they're continually getting feedback and knowing where they grow. Um, here's an example of one of the assessments or what our assessments generally look like when we give it to our learners each week. Uh, we will start one week um, with a standard or standards that are addressed in our lessons. And then they'll have individual practice or it's, it's like our homework, but we don't, it's not, necessarily something that we're like hyper focused on having them do we want to have them demonstrate most of their learning in the classroom um, and show us what they can do in the classroom so on our assessments there's really two key attributes that um, we have tried as a team um, to implement and over on the left side of the assessment that you see on the screen um, when this test is printed out, the learners fold over the left edge so that we can't see their names when we're assessing. Um, so that we're creating this bias resistant grading to protect the learners from our blind spots when we're grading. Because sometimes we, learners in our class, we have, um, when they come in, some predetermined ideas of like how they should be performing. Um, and if we don't see their names, then it, it can at least reduce that bias in our grading and we can be more equitable as we are grading each of our learners assessments on the standard. So it is really just focused on this is the standard. Did they show me the standard? Um, another attribute to the assessment is um, at the top, we have three markings that we put, but we also have the standard written on it. So they know like this assessment was this standard. Um, we have the three markings where it's X, M, E, and a check. And this is to show the learners, like, how are they progressing towards the standards that's written on this assessment? Um, X is not yet meeting the standard, um, or they're like, they don't, they're not meeting the full standard. Um, M, E is minor error that's not associated with the standard, but it's still some math concept that was incorrect. Um, and then the check on there is that they met the standard. We're not giving them a number on their assessments because we want them to focus on like, this is what you know in relationship to the standard. I, I my goal in having this is, it's not about the number that you get or the score that we're, we've become accustomed to. It's not like, oh, I got 75% on this assessment or on this problem. Um, and I really wanted to focus on like, this is what you know of the standard. And so, then when it comes to when we're grading um, in the grade book, I'm having completely standards. All of my assignments in my grade book is the standard and or is the individual standards that is assessed for the course all based on this. And because we need to conform to giving a letter grade, um, we needed to figure out some sort of scale to correlate what the learners know to what these letters um, that we that I've grown up um, in my schooling means in terms of their grade. Um, so, like an A is like you know all of the academic standards for this course. That that's my idea. A B is you know a a large majority of the standards. A C is you got some or you're making progress. Um, a D is like you're showing work uh, and an F 
would be like you're doing absolutely nothing. So in um, our work at the math team at Bolas, we we tried <laughs> to figure out ways to have the number that we put into the grade book and the letter that is outputted um, make sense for what we were seeing with our learners. Uh, last year was our first iteration of like translating these scores. Um, and what we saw from that was that it wasn't as accurate to their to their knowledge. And like another pillar is accuracy. And what we noticed last year was a lot of learners were receiving Bs and yet they weren't actually meeting a lot of the standards. So in that highlighted section in iteration one is how is what changed in iteration two this year to um, make the grade more reflective of what we see that the learners are learning. Because what I had noticed with my courses or with some of my learners was um, I had a learner who of all the standards, they only met partial pieces of standard, but based on iteration one's um, correlation to a number, they ended up with a B in the course and moved on to the next course. And I didn't feel like that was right. Also, given that we were in a pandemic, like maybe that's why we were nicer, uh, but it, it, it didn't feel right to move this learner on to the next course. And uh, <laughs> I'm also like at a school where the learner that I had for uh, the course last year is in in the next course with me this year. So I'm I know where this learner needs to grow. But if I was to send this learner from algebra into geometry with another teacher and they and the teacher saw that they received a B in algebra, theoretically, a teacher seeing that would think that that learner is strong in algebra. Um, but from my observations of like, I did the assessments, I, I greeted this child's assessments, this, this learner isn't actually as strong as this grade is representative, represented. Um, so with iteration two, we tried to um, adjust for that. So because the math standards are just, has a lot of nitty grittiness um, and we're trying to see that and we're seeing that it, the grades that we're seeing is a little bit more reflective of what the learners know um, with the second iteration. But as I'm reading uh, Grading for Equity and in preparation for our next session on uh, motivation, the third pillar, um, actually, uh, yeah, uh, why my current grading includes their homework. Um, homework is something that's done outside the class. Um, I need to rethink like, how, how do I make it so that homework is motivational and they do it, but not include it as part of the grade? Because I, I can't really control what they do outside of my classroom, and I want my grade to be reflective of what they know. Um, so with this community of practice, I'm recognizing, like, this is how I need to change. Another thing that I want to change is these learners are allowed to retake any of their assessment standard assessments so that they show me that they understand the content. Um, and with the with the retakes currently, um, they're just doing it if they feel like they want to show me. Um, but in that preparation for our next session, this quote retakes are equitable only if only when they are mandatory um, really stuck out with me and 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 so next year um i want to emphasize or moving forward i really want to emphasize like y'all need to do these retakes because i really want your grade to be representative of the content that you know and um, so so, so those are some of my takeaways from this community of practice, and I'm glad that it has reaffirmed a lot of the things, actions that I've taken in my course. Um, and this has been a journey that has taken multiple years. Um, Allie here um, is actually on my team 
um, at Bolas. And like, I have conversations with her daily about our grading practices and like how we should change um, and what we see is appropriate. We constantly have conversations about this. And luckily I've been at school with a partner that has been here like for the duration of my journey at Bolas. So it's some a constant conversation that we are open to having. Um, and it's, it's not something that we shy away from and we want to do what's right for our learners. All right, so Kristen, thank you. Liam, thank you so much for sharing your journey at Bullis Charter School. I don't know if you can see, but like the chat was just exploding from some of the things that you were talking about. Like you have to focus on the standard, looking at the skills, really looking at how that motivates students. And then how you said about the collaboration, how you and your partner are constantly talking about that and working through it. And, you know, it really is to have a thought, great to have a thought partner and someone to work along this journey with you and that you're constantly iterating. Like we did this first and then we change it to this. And now we're, it, it's always, it's a journey. And that's what we were talking about, sharing your journey with us because it is ever evolving. And the more we learn, the more we grow and the more we change. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Uchenna Lewis, who's going to share her journey and her, um, her story. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I'm Uchenna Lewis, and I'm a supervising improvement partner with Partners in School Innovation. I currently lead the Middle Grades Impact Teams Network that supports seven middle schools across four districts. And just like Liam, I have a few of my colleagues here today. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I have an awesome team that I work with, which includes um, Amanda and Juliana, who are both improvement coaches and work at different sites across the four districts. Um, so partners, just like SCOE, is committed to ensuring that all students, regardless of their background, thrives. Um, in 2019, Partners uh, was honored to receive a Gates Validation Grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that has allowed us to sponsor four networks of school improvement. Um, we currently have two networks in Philly, one network in Los Angeles, and one that supports the East Side Alliance. And that's the one that we support. Um, and our theory really is that if we deliver consistent high quality research-based approach and support to schools, and we help to build the adult capacity um, in terms of instruction and use of data, then we will um, support our schools to see significant um, student achievement results. And so our middle grades impact team network aims to significantly increase the number of Latinx English language learners and low income students across the East Side Alliance who are on track to excel in high school, college, career, and life. And this network is um, a four year network. And currently we are in year two of our network. And so the first two years of our network focuses on supporting middle school math teachers. And in year three, we're gonna to transition to what we call like a transformation network, which is um, designed to support whole school transformation. So we're starting with like um, a more narrow focus on mathematics and then shifting to the whole school. One of the continuous improvement tools we employ, employed this year was the creation of a driver diagram. Um, to create our network theory of improvement, we consulted with district superintendents, site leaders, and ultimately there were five main change concepts that our key stakeholders agree we would focus on, which are listed there in yellow. The five areas became formative assessment, equitable grading practices, EL supports, uh, PLC, and use of student voice. And so soon after we developed this driver diagram, we learned that SCOE was hosting a grading for equity community of practice. And so um, Jesse Rowe, who is a senior improvement partner, and myself, 
um, we both signed up to attend the sessions with SCOE so that we can more deeply learn about equitable grading in order to better support all the schools that we serve. And I was grateful to have a bit of an accountability partner um, in reading Feldman's book. And Jesse noted these benefits. Um, he, he was saying that in attending the SCOE trainings, he was able to draw inspiration from teachers who are implementing specific change ideals from the book. For example, Lean's example of folding down the side of the test to prevent bias. Like how great is that to hear about that specific strategy? Um, also, he felt as an improvement partner, like we work with the principals and the teachers. And so it gave us a better um, understanding and perspective to hear directly from teachers throughout the county because many teachers throughout the county go to the um, SCOE Grading for Equitable uh, Community of Practice sessions. And also we then had the opportunity to discuss implementation ideals with other administrators because there's also administrators that attend the uh, community of practice. And so through our network, uh, we began hosting in our network sessions what we called uh, change ideal PLCs. And Jesse is actually the one who has been leading our equitable grading PLC in which we began seeing some specific equitable grading practices emerge across the sites. Um, those um, included implementing standards-based grading, um, implementing a minimum F policy, moving away from zero and eliminating behavioral and participation components for grades and allowing more flexibility for late work, especially um, as the pandemic set on its, its sites. Um, with our sites, we do something called ROSI, which is the results-oriented cycle of inquiry. So we set goals with them, plan, act, assess, and then have them reflect and adjust. And so that is um, our version of a PDSA cycle and how we support our schools to do a continuous improvement. And so I wanted to spotlight um, three sites of our seven um, that are implementing some specific equitable grading practices. So the first one I'd like to talk about is Davis. Um, Davis has recently begun um, just this year uh, using rubrics to um, look at specific standards. Um, they feel like this is supporting them to move towards more transparency and standards-based grading. Um, a second school I would like to spotlight is Bridges. Um, one of the cool things is that Bridges actually has a core group of people, including their principal, who also attend SCOE's Grading for Equi Equity Community of Practice so that they can learn more about equitable grading practices. And so at Bridges, they have moved to use like a 50 point scale for their grading. So instead of the normal zero to 100 range for grades, they're now using 50 as their minimum F up to 100. And they also are now allowing retakes um, where the retake actually replaces in full the initial grade for that particular um, assignment or standard. And then lastly, I'd like to highlight August Boger. Um, at August Boger, um, the partner's coach, Amanda, she meets regularly with um, the leader, which is Shannon, and teachers to review grades with them. And then she, um, through monitoring grade data and trends, she supports them to consider specific shifts that are aligned with equitable grading practices. And so across our network, we see a variety of ways that educators are engaging around making grading practices more equitable. One of our roles as a hub leader is to share and accelerate the learning of our sites. And we are appreciative to have a space to learn more deeply alongside um, organizations like SCOE. Um, finally, we'd like to leave you with some resources. Um, so I believe Tara will drop a link in the chat um, but this is kind of what you'll see on the resource page. And I would like to call attention to two specific resources there at the bottom. 
The first one is um, the equitable grading overview. That's a good resource if you're just like introducing equitable grading practices at your site and you wanna get other people involved in considering like um, the big picture about equitable grading. And then even more so, I'd like to highlight the um, practice guide for equitable grading which is chalked full of resources. Are there any leaders on the call? Anyone who lead, any leaders like principals or leaders? Okay, are there any teachers on the call? All right, so this document is broken up into specific leader actions and specific teacher actions um, to support equitable grading practices. So I'd like to just um, hope you guys have a chance to check out those resources. And I appreciate being able to um, work with SCOE to learn more about equitable grading. Thank you, Jenna. Um, as you Jenna mentioned, we do have this resource document that is an offering to you. It has copies of a PDF of our slides. It also has links to Joe Feldman's Grading for Equity website and a copy of that first chapter, the prologue in the first chapter of Grading for Equity. So you can get a teaser if you wanna, if you haven't already purchased it or haven't read it yet, you can get a teaser of that prologue and first chapter. And then the other link in there is to a, um, another um, resource from the standards-based classroom. And um, that's the Making Learning the Goal. It's um, the complimentary website to a book called the standards-based classroom. So that offering is there for y'all um, on the PEDF. They are all hyperlinked and we'll take you to those resources. Um, so we've got about four minutes. Um, what questions have surfaced for you? If there's, if you have questions for Liam or Jenna or Kirsten or I, um, feel free to ask. Um, yes, and of course, thank you for joining us. <laughs> And you can also unmute yourself too and ask. I have a question for Liam. Um, as you, what did you initially find when you um, folded the paper? Was it just you or were other colleagues on your team doing that same practice? What were your initial findings when you started doing practices where you couldn't see the student's name so you didn't tap into oh, this student struggles this way, or this student actually always gets everything right, so I don't really, what, what were things that were coming up for you? Um, so it, the anonymous grading actually started with the pandemic last year. We were giving assessments through Desmos, and Desmos, you can anonymize the learners, and I had done that last year, and I was like, oh, I'm grading so much fairer for all my learners, because I had some learners that came into the class thinking they knew all the content. So I would grade a little bit harsher. I, I would have graded a little bit harsher if I knew their name because they had like planted seeds in my mind that they knew everything. So um, like anonymizing it allowed me to be like, I'm grading all of my kids the exact same way um, on the content and not what they should have known. Um, and I, it's like, deeply impacted my grading. And so when we came back in person this year, I was like, how can I replicate that um, and still and give paper assessments because I hated looking at the computer. Um, so like I came up with this and I shared it with Allie and um, our whole math team is doing this in terms of like, we give these assessments and uh, the kids hide their names. And I, I I also told the kids why I was doing this. And I was like, I, I don't wanna see your name because I just wanna see that you know the content. Um, and then the name is there for when I have to record the scores. And um, maybe Ali can share like how it's impacted her as well. Um, I think the, the same thing. Um, there's definitely like times where, you know, I have certain thoughts about kids and I try to eliminate that and how I'm grading. But when I saw their name, um, in the past, I'd always be like, oh, you know, they should have gotten this right. Or, oh, you know, I know they're struggling with this, so let me be a little bit more lenient. Um, and this has uh, allowed me to be more fair, for sure. Because um, I go through, I'm just like, okay, this person, they've met the standard. And then I could be like, look at the name afterwards and be like, awesome for that person. But not having to have any additional thoughts in my mind about who the kid is, what type of resources they may have or not have, uh, has been really beneficial, I think, for us as a whole team to try to grade really fairly and 
based just on what they know about the standards and not any other you know, background information that we have about them. That's powerful. Thank you for sharing. All right. Thank you for your questions. Um, as we all know, all good things must come to an end. And it is uh, 1040 or 1045 now. Um, so in the last like 30 seconds of our time together, um, think about your current grading practices within your context. Who is it working for? Who is it not working for? Um, and is the system designed to fail certain groups of students? And ultimately, what can we do about that? My parting thought for you today comes from Admiral Grace Hopper. Um, this is, she's a fantastic scientist, um, innovator. She found the first computer bug, which was literally a bug inside the computer she was developing. Um, but in her words of wisdom, the most damaging phrase in the lang in language is it's always been done that way. So we go we challenge you to go out there, shake things up, um, reinvent our system, and in order to serve our students equitably. So with gratitude, um, on behalf of our presenting team, we want to thank you for your time today and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>